yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for joining the session. Um, we're going to talk about causal inference in theory and practice. Uh, my name is Mimi Liotiu. Um, I'm a senior research data scientist at Dunhambi in London. And as Dave mentioned before, Dunhambi, my PhD was on causal inference methods. And now at Dunhambi, one of my side projects is developing the company's causal inference capability. So just a few words about Dunhambi uh, before we start with causal inference. So Don Humvee is a global leader in customer data science, empowering businesses everywhere to compete and thrive in the modern data-driven economy. We always put the customer first, and we are a part of the Tesco group. And just to give you a more visual idea of um, what we do, so we operate in all these countries that you see here. We work with 78 retailers, um, more than a thousand consumer packaged goods clients, millions of active customers, uh, three, 30 billion baskets, and these are some of the retailers and brands that we work with. So yeah, just to give you a quick idea. Now moving on to um, our topic for today, um, we're going to start with the basics from the theory for causal inference, uh, covering the causal data science pipeline and its four stages. And then we're going to move into the practical component where uh, we're going to do a quick tour of applying the causal data science to a retail case study in Python. So I'm sure you probably have heard by now that correlation is not the same as causation. Um, for example, there's lots of uh, cases of spurious correlations, and some examples that often crop up are these two. Um, so spurious correlations are ones where one variable does not directly cause the other. In this example, one study found that the number of shark attacks is positively correlated with the volume of ice cream sales at some sampled beaches over a year. And in this other study, they found that uh, countrywide chocolate consumption is positively correlated with Nobel prizes per capita. Now we can see, okay, one doesn't make sense for us to say that this causes the other, that like eating ice cream makes you more appealing to a shark or eating chocolates makes you more likely to win a Nobel prize. Rather, there must be something else going on, some other explanation, for example, common causes. So indeed here we could say, you know, when it's summer, people are more likely to go to the beach because the summer is warm and swim. And then they might, some of them might get attack, attacked by a shark. Also in the summer it's hot. So then they might also want to eat ice cream. So that's kind of what explains this pattern. Um, and similarly, kind of in the Nobel case, it's been suggested uh, that maybe income per capita is the underlying sort of common cause. So high income per capita means people can better afford to consume lots of chocolate um, and the country then gets enough tax money to be able to heavily invest in education and research. So people are more likely to be able to get Nobels. And indeed, some uh, analysts did a replication study of this, and they found that after controlling for per capita income, this correlation is insignificant. So unfortunately, all the data science and statistical and machine learning methods that we know and use tell us only about correlations. They can't tell us about associate uh, or associations, but they can tell us about causation. So for example, if you run a regression, uh, you fit your model and you get some estimates for the coefficients out. Um, these tell you about associations and they can include spurious associations so they can be biased. So the coefficient i for input feature xi is not its causal effect on the outcome. It just shows its relationship in an associational way with the outcome. Um, because again, a coefficient can capture spurious associations. So basically things that come from other unspecified causal effects of other features outside your model and potentially even inside your model. Um, instead, what you want for your insights from say your regression model to be actionable, you want your coefficients to be able to tell you to answer this question of what if I change? So if I intervene on the value of this input feature, what change is this going to cause in the value of the outcome variable? And to be able to answer such questions about the effects of taking actions, of interventions, we need causal methods. So, okay, what other kinds of causal questions um, are common? What are some more examples of causal questions that then require causal methods? So whenever you have a question of the form, what is the effect or the impact of something like a media campaign, a customer joining a loyalty scheme or of inflation, on something else, an important outcome like sales or store footfall, for example, the effect of advertising an ice cream product on its sales, these are causal questions. Um, 
You might have broader questions like why have this product sales fallen compared to last year? Or what are the drivers behind or the factors affecting product sales and what's the relative strength? Other terms that people often use when they try to answer causal questions are incrementality, uplift, test and control groups, A-B tests, trials, and matching. Um, so why questions and questions about effects and impact and drivers and so on are causal and they require causal methods. So as we saw before in these examples, it seemed that the solution to try and go from correlation to causation was to adjust for the key sort of underlying causal variable. So other things that affect the picture and give rise to these patterns. So, okay, what if we have a question that's, um, what is the effect of advertising a product on its sales? And th for this kind of question, what should we adjust for to isolate the causal effect of this advertising event from spurious correlations? Um, there may be many possibly relevant variables that we could adjust for. Uh, for example, variables that capture the traits of the product, like its price or its quality, traits of the category that the product is in, like its sales of the category, traits of competing products, competing retailers, traits of the seasonality and the weather, features of the economy and how it's doing, attitudes of consumers. So lots of things that we could adjust for. The question is, should we adjust for all of them? If so, which ones? The thing is, if we just naively adjust for all of them, if, or if we just around, uh, adjust for the wrong ones, we might end up introducing bias into our estimates. So to answer this question, what should we adjust for? We need graphical causal methods. Now, just to give you a broader picture of how the traditional data science pipeline compares to the causal one, this is the traditional pipeline, which is associational. It's about prediction and goodness of fit of your predicted Y to the real Y. So you might start by defining the problem. Often this step is vague or skipped and we go straight to our data uh, and we look at our data and we try to figure out, you know, whatever data we happen to have available, we look at it and we say, let's just do some data mining. What features can we mine out of this data? Um, we select our features and then we use those and apply our estimation models like regression or matching. And then we validate these models with standard techniques. And then if we get asked about explainability, we might use feature importance. However, this is a, feat a weaker form of explainability because it just says, what is the importance of this feature for the goodness of it of this model? Instead, the causal pipeline still cares about goodness of fit, but it also cares about explanation. So the Vita hat, so I say the regression coefficients and how those can be um, interpreted as causal effects. So instead for the causal pipeline to make causal claims, we need to first carefully define the problem. What's our cause of interest X? What's our outcome of interest Y? Um, what are our units of analysis? What are other possibly relevant causes? And then we throw all of that into our causal directed acyclic graph, which represents um, the data generating process that um, is behind the data that we might have. Then, Having drawn or calls a diagram, its structure allows us to run the so-called identification step to then figure out what should we adjust for to remove bias and from spurious correlations. And then finally, we can do estimation. So this is where the data comes in. It doesn't need to come in before. And estimation is just the same thing as here, the same sorts of models. And then to validate the models, again, you can do the same stuff, plus also some causal validation of your data against the causal diagram and your causal estimate. And finally, for explainability, this comes baked in and it's now a stronger form of explainability, which is actually causal. So these are the key steps of the pipeline. And now we're going to cover the theory basics, taking each step of the uh, pipeline one by one. So the first step is to think of your problem and represent it as a causal DAG, so directed the cyclic graph, also known as causal diagram or a graphical causal model. So the key phrase thing here to remember is no causes in, no causes out. To make causal claims, data alone isn't enough. Instead, we also need knowledge or assumptions about the data generating process. So the causal processes underlying and the mechanisms underlying what um, gets to manifest in our data. So how the world works, how reality works. And we can um, use you know, knowledge from our do domain expertise, from previous studies, from experiments, and so we can represent and we can do that and figure out what are the relevant variables and represent those as nodes in a DAG. This is a DAG from epidemiology. And then we can draw the arrows between them that represents the causal relationships. So in a DAG, um, an arrow from variable A to variable B means that A is a possible cause of B. 
Now, if we run estimation and it turns out the effect of A on B is actually zero, that's fine. This is still a valid thing to have in the DAG. Instead, the strongest assumption is the absence of an error from A to B, because this encodes that we think that A is definitely not the cause of B. It can't possibly cause B. Um, for example, temporal precedence. So if we know that A happened after B, then yes, OK, definitely A cannot cause B. So to create a DAG, um, it's important to work with your team and your stakeholders so that then you'll create a transparent representation of your shared understanding of the world. And in it, you should include all possible causal variables, even if you don't have them all of them in your data, and all possible causal arrows. So again, this logic. Um, and yeah, you might end up with a very complex diagram, which is okay, because reality is complex. So this, again, is a real causal DAG from an epidemiology study, and it's very complex. But that's what we want. We want our DAG to be as representative and as realistic as possible. A bit more on causal uh, graphs. So in the DAG with an arrow from A to B and then from B to C, A is called the parent of B here and B a child of A, C a descendant of A, A an ancestor of C. An endogenous variable is one that has parents in the DAG, otherwise it's called exogenous. A path is a sequence of arrows through variables, regardless of the arrow's directions. They don't all have to be in the same direction within a given path. Now, a causal DAG uh, is actually a mathematical object uh, representing the underlying joint probability distribution of the variables in it. It's governed by the causal Markov condition, which means endogenous variables only depend on their parents. So it's a mathematical object denoting probabilities, so we can check those against our data using standard statistical tests. Uh, for example, in this uh, DAG, this is the joint probability distribution that it um, entails or that it represents. Uh, now, some important path and variable types uh, that are key um, are these ones. So when you have B being a cause of A and C, B is called the fork on this path or a common cause of A and C. And in this path, B is a common consequence of A and C. B is called the collider. Great. So let's say we have a causal DAG. Now, based on the structure of the DAG, we can perform so-called identification, which is what allows us to isolate causal effect. This is what tells, tells us which variables to adjust for. So if we want the pure causal effect of X, this is our cause of interest is also often called the treatment, on Y, which is our outcome, free from spurious associations by, or bias, same thing, this is what we need to do. So adjusting for or controlling for a set of variables Z means grouping by or segregating by or stratifying on the set Z. For example, if you want to do estimation using regression, the adjusting for Z means regressing on Z. So your input feature should be your cause of interest and Z. If instead you're doing matching, for example, then you should match on Z to say you've adjusted for Z. Again, adjusting for all variables can introduce bias, as we're going to see. Rather, it's just important to really adjust for the right ones. And this step is automated, so you don't need to worry too much about it. But because it is a key element of the causal pipeline, I'm going to get into some more detail in the next slides. Um, but again, you don't need to like understand it immediately, and it is automated in the packages we're going to see later. So interventions. Causal effects are interventions or surgeries or manipulations on the DAG's arrows. So the causal effect of X on Y is represented in do notation by the probability of Y equals small y given do X equals small x. So this is the intervention action. So the, this means the probability or frequency that event y equals small y would occur if, hypothetically, x were set to the particular value small x through experimental manipulation or intervention. So performing this surgery on the DAG would look like this. If this is our original DAG, let's call this model P, we would have to delete all arrows into x, resulting in this. And then we would have to set x's value to small x and leave all of the rest of the DAG unchanged. So now we end up with the manipulated model PM, M for manipulated, which advertises a different uh, conditional probability, uh, sorry, joint probability distribution, different in this part. So the causal effect for X and Y with this do expression then um, is equivalent to just con the conditional probability of Y on X in this model. So if you're doing regression, you can map these probabilities to expectations. This would mean if you had experimental data like this, it would just be enough experimental as in because we performed this intervention or experimental manipulation, then it would just be enough 
to regress y on x, assuming that uh, you assigned x to the various values completely randomly. So that is kind of like a randomized control trial. Instead, if you've got observational data, you're still in this model uh, of just how the world works. You've not intervened in it at all. Um, but here, there's this backdoor, so-called backdoor path between X and Y. Other than this direct path, which is the causal effect we care about, there's this backdoor path through this variable, which introduces bias. So here, the causal effect of Y is not the same as just um, this conditional probability of Y on X. So we need the identification step to figure out what should we do? Should we adjust for you? Should we do something else? So, okay. One key definition for identification is blocking or deseparation. So a set of nodes Z block or deseparate a path P if and only if P contains a chain or a fork such that the middle node is in the set Z, so M is conditioned on, or P contains a collider such that neither the collision node nor any of its descendants are in set Z. So we treat colliders differently to common causes or confounders. That's the key thing to remember. You, sh you, know, you shouldn't adjust for colliders, but you should condition on confounders. So if set, Z, if, sorry, if set Z blocks every path between the two nodes X and Y, then X and Y are deseparated, conditional on Z, and thus they're independent, conditional on Z. So why do we care about this definition? Because we're going to use it next. So the backdoor criterion is the key thing. It tells us how should, can, about it tells about how do we block all backdoor or spurious paths. So the backdoor criterion says that a set of variables Z satisfies the backdoor criterion relative to X and Y if no node in Z is a descendant of Z of X and Z blocks the definition we saw before every path between X and Y that contains an arrow into X. Then this Z is called a sufficient admissible already confounding set. And the minimal deconfounding set is the smallest such Z uh, that satisfies the backdoor criterion. So basically, we have to adjust for this deconfounding set Z to remove confounding bias um, and recover the pure causal effect of X and Y and make it so-called identifiable uh, from observational data. So here's an example of a standard statistical paradox that causal methods allow us to resolve, just to show you how these steps draw the DAG, step two, identify, help us solve these problems. Simpson's paradox uh, is about different or even reverse effects being observed in the whole population versus in subpopulations. For example, let's say we have this question, what is the effect of weekly exercise on cholesterol level? And say we analyze the data and we find the whole population has, we see a positive effect. However, if we adjust for or segregate by age, we see the effect is negative. So which one is the right answer? Should we adjust for age? So with the stuff we just saw from causal methods, the solution is this. First, you've got to draw your causal diagram. And if we know that age is a possible cause of exercise uptake, and also it's a possible cause of cholesterol levels, this is our DAG. This shows that age is a confounder, a fork, so we should adjust for it. Um, to recover the pure causal effect of exercise on cholesterol. So this is what the right answer is. It's uh, a negative relationship which should segregate or adjust for age. But this isn't always the case. For example, Bergson's paradox is a different paradox uh, where we tend to observe false, uh, falsely a negative correlation between two desirable traits. For example, let's say we have this question of are an actor's beauty and talent correlated? In the general population, we see no association. However, if we adjust for whether an actor was hired to star as the lead in a movie, negative associations appear. So again, what is the right answer? Data alone doesn't let us answer this question. But if we draw the causal DAG and identify the uh, effect of interest, so first we draw the DAG. And if we know that hire has possible causes in beauty and talent, then that shows us that hire is a collider and we should not adjust for it. So here, the right thing to do is use the unadjusted for hire uh, data. So we shouldn't adjust for this because it's a collider. And there's more paradoxes that causal methods allow us to resolve. Um, you can see more here and in the resources I'm going to share at the end. So, OK, identification beyond the backdoor estimate. There's two other possible estimates that, as we'll see, the DUI library supports. What is their value? Um, so if any confounders in our minimum deconfounding set uh, are unmeasured, these allow us to still identify the effect, subject, however, to further assumptions. So instrumental variables 
require this sort of um, DAG where an instrument Z only affects Y through its causal path into X. However, your DAG might instead have other common causes between Z and Y. Z is no longer a valid instrument here if this isn't measured. Um, or there might be other structures more complex where you still need to um, run identification to see if there's any backdoor variables that you can adjust for. For example, this here that like would then tell you, okay, this is now a valid instrument. So you still have to check for the backdoor criterion to see if you're left with a valid instrument. And the front door criterion, uh, so in this sort of DAG, this is a valid front door variable, which mediates the whole of the effect of X on Y, but there need to be no other arrows from X to Y, no other paths like that. There needs to be no confounding between this Z and Y. So again, you still are gonna need to check for those other paths. You're gonna need to check for backdoor paths to figure out if you're gonna have a front door variable that's valid. So again, the backdoor stuff still applies. So that's why we're going to focus on it today. Now, let's say you found your estimate and you want to do estimation to get a number for your effect. So if it's a backdoor estimate, standard data science methods apply. Um, if you're doing regression and it's linear, your coefficient is now the causal effect. If it's not linear, you can use partial dependence plots with scikit-learn supports in these algorithms only, um, which are the equivalent of the coefficient in linear systems. You shouldn't use variable importance because, again, that's just about associations and the contribution of each feature to the goodness of it rather than its causal effect. There's other newer estimation methods that you might have heard of, like meta learners, double machine learning, and so on. These, however, assume unconfoundedness, that there's no confounding. So basically, you must still draw the DAG and identify deconfound. So these aren't identification strategies, they just do estimation. So you still need to do the previous two steps. And if you've managed to find a valid instrument or a valid front door estimate, then there's ways to perform estimation there. For example, if it's a linear system, you can do for instrumental variables, world estimator, two stage least squares regression, and for front door, you can again do two SLS applied in a different way. Now, okay, let's say we've estimated our causal effect and now we wanna validate our causal assumptions uh, against the data. So causal diagrams have testable implications in the data sets that they generate. So we can know that the DAG is wrong and also where, which part of it is the mistaken and perform standard statistical tests to do this check. So as we saw earlier, this separation in the DAG implies conditional independencies in the data. So when Z separates X from Y, then X is conditionally independent of Y given Z. So in this DAG, U this separates X and Y. So in our data, we should find no significance dependence between X and Y conditional on Y. If we do find a dependence, that means the, data is the DAG is inconsistent with the data generating process behind the data set. So maybe there's another path from X to Y or from Y to X or other common causes between them. And there's further methods for computing the whole final estimate in do Y as we'll see later. So just to summarize again, these are the different pipelines as we saw. Um, this stuff is really important and it's new stuff that we gotta do to make causal claims. This step is also new, but it's automated, so it shouldn't take much more time to implement. This stuff is the same as in the traditional pipeline. This stuff is the same with some new stuff, that, but also automated mostly. And explainability comes in baked in uh, and it's a stronger causal explainability. So now with causal methods, we have transparent AI in that the DAG is a very transparent representation of all of our, our underlying assumptions. It's explainable, there's causal explanations baked in, and it's reliable and robust. <clears throat> so if you'd like to learn more, these are some great resources that I highly recommend. This is a crash course paper with slides, examples. These are great books. Uh, most of these are free online. Some of them have Python and R code examples. And now moving to our practical component, um, we're gonna do this in Python applying the causal methods to a retail problem. Now, do Y is a library in Python that we're going to use, and we're going to briefly touch upon the Daggity library, which is implemented in R, but also has a front end in an online tool that we're going to use very briefly. So let me now move to the notebook that we're going to use. I trust you can see this. Um, and so now we're going to illustrate causal methods in practice. Um, so let's say we have a retailer and they offer a premium monthly subscription program 
which offers further discounts on mainline shopping to whoever subscribes to this and benefits with this retailer's other verticals like a clothing line or a cafe, etc. So the question then is, what is the effect of subscribing to this program on mainline spend at this company? And we're going to use synthetic data for this. So, okay, let's start applying the causal pipeline. First, we've got to draw the causal DAG, map out the relevant variables. So our cause of interest is subscribing or not. Why is spend our outcome? And then what are other relevant causes? So then we'd need to sit down and think with our team and stakeholders of all potential causes and causal paths that could affect whether someone subscribes and also could affect their spend. And let's say we do this and we come up with um, these variables. Let's say someone suggests disposable income because high income might mean we spend more and maybe we care or we don't care about discounts and benefits of this program. So this is a possible cause of both of these things. M maybe age is also relevant causal variables because at different ages and different life stages, people have different needs. Someone in their 20s versus someone in their 70s or in, this, uh, in the 40s. Family size might be another relevant factor. If someone has a large family in their household, they might shop more and they might spend more. So they might see more value in actually subscribing to this dis discount scheme and getting extra benefits. If someone is interested in the verticals that the scheme offers benefits for, then that might entice them to join. And there might be many more causes. Realistically, there'll be many more. Um, you know, we even mentioned briefly in the slides things like what other retailers are doing. Um, what's the economy doing and stuff are relevant causes. But in the interest of time, we're going to stop here. So you can draw all this in the causal DAG as you go uh, with all possible arrows and visualize the DAG. In do y you can do this, importing this, um, this stuff. And then, by the way, this is the version I'm using of do I'm using 0 0.8. The latest one released last month is this one. So to represent your causal diagram, you can use this digraph syntax where you have all arrows from to from to for all of the causes. And then you got to also uh, create a data frame object. This one just needs to have column names, one for each variable in your DAG, but it doesn't need to contain any data. So if some of these are measured, that's OK. If you don't have them in your data, you don't need to worry about that yet. So this is your um, data frame. And then you pass this data frame into your causal model object and the causal graph that you defined above. This also goes here. You tell do I, this is my treatment. This is the cause of interest and this is the outcome of interest. And this is your model and then you can view it. And this is a nice visualization. So this is our cause of interest whose effect we want to estimate on spend. There's other ways to visualize the DAG, maybe using network X in Python on the, or the DAGIT interactive web tool as we'll see later. So great, we now have the DAG. We can run identification on it to see what we should adjust for. This is how to do identification in Y. You call this function on the model, and this is the output. So it says, OK, it hasn't found the front door estimate. It has not found an instrumental variable estimate, but it has found a backdoor estimate. And how to read this? OK, so this is telling us that the, the causal effect of premium subscription on the conditional expectation of post-spend uh, needs to be conditioned on these variables in order for this to be a causal effect. So this is your minimum minimal deconfounding set, the stuff after the vertical line. So now we know what variables we should adjust for, and we can proceed to estimation. Now the data comes in right before estimation. Um, now that we know what we should adjust for, we can look at our data to see, does it contain good measures for all of the variables that we're supposed to be adjusting for? And let's say we inspect our data and let's say we find it does contain adequate looking measures for all the variables in the minimal deconfounding set. So let's say for the disposable income variable, it has a binary affluent segmentation that we're happy to use. For family size, it has the number of children under the age of 18 at the household. For interest in verticals, it has the past uh, percentage of previous spend on verticals. And we can say, OK, well, this is a good enough measure of interest. And for age, it already has a column measuring age in years. But if your data set does not contain good measures for all variables in the minimal confounding set, then you can't identify, you can isolate the causal effect. Uh, because you, So you still have confounding bias. So either you try to get data on whatever variables are observed, or you don't make causal claims, or you try sensitivity analysis to try and bind the size of any remaining bias from these unmeasured confounders. But this requires extra assumptions, as we're going to see later on.
So, okay, in this case, our data contains measurements for all of the min confounders in the minimal set, great. It also has these measurements for our cause of interest in a binary way and for the effect of interest in aggregate spend in pounds in the 12 months after the window of opportunity to subscribe to this program for each given window. So great, so now we can load in our data, we can inspect it, it looks like this. There's columns for all of the above causal variables and there's one row per household. So now we gotta make the variable measure names in the data set match the ones in the DAG. So we take the causal model that we defined above and we just replace the variable names by the measure names, wherever they're different. Um, we run this again, we run identification again, we get the same things to adjust for, adjust the names of the variable measures now. Great, so now we can run estimation because we know what to adjust for. So do I internally itself also implement some estimation methods? So for example, you can pass it the estimates above and tell it I want to do linear regression because and I have a backdoor estimate uh, and it does it. So again, it prints out that expression that we saw above. It also prints out the functional form of the regression. It's telling you I'm regressing this on all of that. Uh, and it says, this is the estimate, this is the result. So this is the mean value, the p-value means this is significant, and these are the confidence intervals for this. And you can even call this dot interpret function, which tells you how to interpret the, the, the results. So it says increasing the treatment variable premium sub from zero to one causes an increase of 555.9 pounds, this is in pounds, in the expected value of the outcome over this data. So this means that if someone joins this premium subscription program, this has a causal effect of them spending 500 something pounds more at this retailer over the next 12 months. Again, this isn't a real number, this is synthetic data. So you might want to do estimation instead using your standard Python libraries like stats models and scikit-learn, and you can do that. As we mentioned, scikit-learn in the tree-based regressors has partial dependence plots, which are coefficient equivalents. So let's say we want to do stats models OLS. We can use the traditional syntax, and we find that the results are exactly the same as the ones in GUI. Now, just as an aside, to illustrate confounding bias and Simpson's paradox with this case study, so in this case, we had to control for everything. This is not a general rule, though, as we've said already. We shouldn't control for colliders, and uh, we don't. We shouldn't necessarily control for confounders that are not in the minimal set because that is not computationally efficient. We just need to control for confounders in the minimal set. So, okay, what if we don't have data for some or all of the variables in the minimal deconfounding set? So we can't adjust for them. Some confounding bias will remain. Will this be? Not a lot of bias, will the effects stay close to the unbiased one or could the bias be very large? Let's see. So let's say in this scenario, all confounders are unobserved. Then um, we just regress uh, our outcome on the cause of interest. We find that the effect is way off from the 550 something. We, it overestimates the effect by a factor of almost two. So very large confounding bias. What if only some of our confounders are unmeasured and we regress on the rest of them, then the estimate is off again, not as crazily, but it's still off by a factor of 1.15. What if affluence is also unobserved, then the effect again is almost um, two times the size of the true effect. Now, in terms of collider bias, just to illustrate that as well. So this is just gonna illustrate the case against throwing all variables as inputs into the model. We're going to have the same DAG. Now we just want the effect of age on spend. And we still have the same data. Now for the effect of age, there's no confounders because there's no arrows into age. So there can't be any common causes between age and the outcome. So what we should do is we just regress the outcome only on age. And that gives us the correct unbiased estimate. So we run this again. The only difference is we tell it now our treatment of interest is age. This is the model, same as before. We run identification and estimation and we print the results. Indeed, UI says, yeah, there's nothing you should condition on. And it says, okay, this is the mean value, uh, 16 point something, it's significant. Okay, what if we wanna adjust for some more variables? Well, the DAG shows that there are three colliders on the paths between age and post spans that we should not adjust for. For example, this is a collider on this path here between age and spend, so this is, a colliding node here, vertical frac is a colliding node on this path. So if we just for any or all of these colliders, we will introduce bias into the estimate. For example, if we just for all, our estimate is now 13 point something instead of 16 point something, 
um, underestimate 18% lower. If we just for some, because say the others are measured, again, the effect can be off even further off than above. So yeah, don't throw in everything in the kitchen sink, as we've said already several times, this can introduce bias. So overall confounding bias and collider bias can lead to very highly biased estimates. So going back to our original correctly identified unbiased estimate where we found uh, an effect of 500 and something pounds with the synthetic data, we can now proceed to validate whether our causal DAG and our whole estimate are consistent with our data. So validation has two steps. First, we can check our DAG versus the data. As we said, this separation in the DAG uh, implies conditional independencies in the data. So what we got to do is first, we have to apply this separation to the DAG to find what conditional and unconditional independencies the DAG implies, if any. And then for each of those, we can test them against the data to see if those variables are indeed conditionally independent in the data, just performing standard statistical tests. So we can do both of these steps in GUI with this refute graph method, which tests whether X is conditionally independent of Y given Z for all possible combinations and all possible value combinations of X, Y, and Z. So this is fairly intensive computationally. Now Z here is a set of variables and it takes a parameter K, uh, which is the number of variables in it. So the maximum number for the size of Z can be, you know, the maximum number, all of the number of variables in our DAG minus these two, uh, so minus two. So we can check, we can run this, we can run this reputation for an empty Z, so size of, size of Z of zero, and then for a Z that only contains one variable, two variables, three, and so on. So we run all of that, and for each um, size of Z, we find that there's zero conditional independencies entailed by the model and zero independencies in our data. So the two are consistent and the test passes, and that's the result in all, all cases. So great, this means our DAG is consistent with this data. And yeah, this specific DAG implies only conditional dependencies. There's no independencies in it. Nothing is separable from anything in this particular DAG. Um, another way to do this test is to check uh, the, what the DAG implies in DAGity. Why do this? So if you'd like to see which conditional independencies the DAG implies, DAGity lists them all, whereas DUI, as we saw, just gives you counts. But you can't load data into DAGity in the web tool. So then whatever output DAGity gives you, you can check each of those conditional independencies against the data back in DUI. Uh, and if any of these fail as, uh, when compared to the data, we will know which part of the DAG is wrong. So that's the part of the DAG we should visit. So that's why it's useful to see each conditional independence relationship to see which one might fail. Now, normally we only check the independence relationships that we found, but as we said here, there's no independencies, but we're just gonna show the functionality below for how to do this in DUI. So DUI has a partial correlation implementation, which tests whether X and Y are independent, so uncorrelated, conditional on Z, and this is the syntax. So we can check, for example, these variables, and the Z is a list, it can be man contain many elements here, it just contains affluence, here it's empty, and these are the results. So how do we eat those? So N is the number of rows in our data, R is the partial correlation coefficient between X and Y conditional on Z, if this is empty, it's just unconditional normal independence, uh, normal correlation. Here, both of these are non-zero, and then the cognitive intervals for this correlation coefficient don't contain zero, so this is telling us this is significant, and indeed the p-value of um, less than 0 0.05 of the significance level is telling us we can reject the null that x and y are independent, conditional on z. So indeed we find that these things are dependent, there's no independencies as we were expecting um, from our DAG. So the DAG is consistent with the data. And lastly, last thing you can do for validation, uh, you can check your final estimate versus the data. So you can check the estimate as it was obtained from the chosen estimation model, which itself was informed by the DAG and the identification step. You can check that versus the data. Uh, do I offer several so-called refuters to do this? For example, let's look at these three. So as the do I documentation says, uh, this goes as follows. Um, they ask this question, does the estimated effect change significantly when we replace the given data set with 
bootstrap sample from the same data set for this reputer or with a random selected, randomly selected subset in this other reputer. And then there's this third refutation test that checks, does the estimation method change its estimate after we add an independent random variable as a common cause to the data set? So for all of these three, the estimated effect should not change. Um, so for these tests to indicate that the results are valid, in their output, they should all give an estimated effect, which is the same thing as we estimated above, that is close to the new effect that these methods compute with the changes they made. So these effects should be close to each other and the p-value should be greater than 0.05, meaning that there's no statistically significant difference between the estimated and the new effects. So we run these robustness tests like this, um, and this is the sort of result we get so what we see is that for each of these three tests, the estimated effect is the thing we calculated already above. The new effect is what each of these uh, refutation tests calculates. They're reasonably close, close enough values, close enough. And indeed, the p-value says, yes, OK, um, this p-value is much greater than 0 0.05, which means uh, there's no statistically significant difference between the two effects. So indeed, all three refuters find that our estimate is consistent with the data. Now, do I have further refuters? Um, notably, one for sensitivity analysis to unmeasured confounders. That's his name. So this tells us how much will the effect estimate change at different levels of unmeasured confounding. For example, will it still be positive? But this requires the user to parameterize uh, this refuter with extra assumptions for the maximum possible effect size that an unmeasured confounder could have based on the user's domain expertise. So extra assumptions are needed, and for more, you can have a look at this DUI notebook. Now, as a final note, the Daggett's online tool that I mentioned, just to show you what it looks like, this is the environment, and you tell it, this is my cause of interest. So you say this is the exposure. You click on this, you say this is the outcome. And to estimate the effect of this on that, Daggett it tells you, given that there's these other variables at play, the biasing paths are open, and these are the minimal sufficient adjustment sets for estimating the total effect of E on D. So you have two deconfounding sets here, A and Z, or B and Z. So there's multiple and two Y lists, more than one. It lists all of the minimal deconfounding sets. Now, do I can also list, as we said, the testable implications, so the conditional independencies that follow from your DAG. Instead of just a number, counting them, it just lists, lists each of them, and then you could take each of them and check it against your data using do I's partial correlation function. And you can just use the same code that you use to define your DAG as a digraph above and paste it into DAGIT, and it's going to work, and it's going to show you your DAG and give you these results as well. So yeah, beyond what we covered just now, if you'd like to understand more about these tools, these are some good resources to check out next. Uh, the DUI user guide here and the Daggety brief cheat sheet guide for just the online tool. Um, so now I'm just going to go back to the slides and just to thank everyone for your attention and just to note that we are hiring for a research data scientist role in our London office in the same team as my team as a team I'm in, and this is uh, the link if you'd like to read more. So